how does executive function change? How can we build a bridge between home and school so that we're all on the same page in supporting mm -hmm. our kids' executive function needs? Um, so here's a, just a light agenda for what we're going to cover. You know, I think this question of what's different between home and school when it comes to executive function and what's the same is going to do a lot to give us the info we need to kind of build that bridge. And we'll explore how gaps between home and school create EF difficulties. Um, executive function is a pretty big topic, but today we're going to use the organization of materials to really kind of focus in on. We're going to use that as our example and explore strategies that we can use to understand the gaps between home and school. And then finally, we're gonna bring it on home with six steps that you can use to promote consistency between EF, um, between home and school, okay? Um, I believe Elizabeth has already kind of mentioned this, but uh, we do have a couple other webinars coming up. So if you can join us for them, we would love that. Um, that would be great. We have reading coming up at the end of the month and math um, in May, May 14th. Um, just a little bit about who we are, Research Institute for Learning and Development. So we are a nonprofit um, educational organization in Lexington, Massachusetts. Executive function is our mission. We believe that EF strategies can be used to empower all students to take charge of their learning and be more successful independent learners. Um, we run conferences, we run workshops and trainings in schools, we do you know, curriculum, we do articles, blog posts, books, we do all sorts of things executive function related. So feel free to check out our website for more resources. Um, uh, we also have a sister organization, the Institute for Learning and Development. Um, and you know, a lot of us kind of work at both, like I do SMARTS, I also work one-on-one -on -one, um, in small groups to do EF coaching. Um, so if you're interested in some of their services, there'll be opportunity to learn more. I'm very excited. We just are putting together a, um, what we call Master Your Mind, an EF boot camp for middle school students. So we don't have the details yet, but we will be releasing that. If that's something you're interested in, you can share that. Um, in the evaluation form and we'll get you more there as well. Um, so we cannot go any further without a quick shout out to um, Dr. Lynn Meltzer, who is our fearless leader. Uh, she is kind of our EF guru, the founder and president of our organization. And her work really informs our approach to executive function. Um, through her work as a professor at Tufts, she worked at Boston Children's, um, through her affiliation with the Harvard Graduate School of Education, we've really kind of developed a applied research and theory approach, you know, to making things that are very practical and usable, which is really the heart of what we're hoping to accomplish today. Um, a lot of great books on executive function. I love that green book, especially that's my EF Bible, but I encourage you if you're looking to do some EF reading, you can find some great stuff that she's put together. Um, and then Lynn did, uh, Elizabeth did mention it. So if you wanted to learn directly from Lynn, um, she's actually leading a series of EF trainings I'll be helping her with starting next week. So we can send out some information on that. Um, Elizabeth did say there is a $20 discount for you lucky people. So uh, feel free to check that out if you're interested. Hope to see you there. Okay, and then finally, you'll see that everything we're doing today has some of the SMARTS branding on it. Um, we are using kind of the SMARTS training materials and curriculum materials to run this webinar. So just so you know what SMARTS is. SMARTS is an executive function strategy instruction curriculum. Um, we teach kids the EF strategies they need to be successful. It's currently used in you know, schools and kind of, you know, learning centers and clinics and things like that um, around the world. Uh, we've got, it's a K to 12 resource, elementary, middle school and high school and college. So I love SMARTS, I'm director of SMARTS, I should have mentioned that. Um, you can get a free sample lesson later if you're interested in more, but I just wanna make sure you know what that was. We've also recently released some like smaller chunks of SMARTS for people who don't necessarily need the full curriculum, but are still interested. So these are called strategy sets. You can check those out on the website. Okay, finally, we are ready to dive into the material. So um, before we get into the difference between home and school, I want to take a second and think about, you know, what do we mean when we say executive function? Because if you do your research, um, you're going to get a lot of different answers. People define executive function in many different ways. And some of those are very like neuroscience based ways with beautiful pictures of the brain. And sometimes it's psychologists on a neuropsych evaluation. And sometimes it's teachers who are up in front of the class. So I want to make sure whatever definition of executive function you use, I want to keep it very concrete. 
instead of thinking about executive function as a synapse in your brain, I want you to think about it as behaviors that you can see and processes that you can analyze. So I'm gonna put up, this is Dr. Meltzer's um, EF paradigm. These are the five areas of executive function related to learning and success in school and beyond that we're going to be using today. And I'm gonna shut up for a second and let Jane kind of talk us through what do these necess what do these look like? What are the concrete behaviors that we can see as we look at EF at school and at home? Okay, thanks, Michael. So if we start at the top at 12 o'clock, you'll see the uh, one element is organizing. So I'm just gonna give some examples. So in school, an example of the need to organize would be students organizing their desk and their locker. And at home, uh, desk and workspace, and also we know that kids have to organize their closets, and so do adults. Uh, if we go to the right, we're gonna go clockwise, goal setting. So an example, of school would be to attend all your classes that might be a goal or to raise a math grade from C to B might be a goal and uh, at home a goal could be to do your homework between 8 and 10 p.m. on Sundays uh, through Thursday or a goal could be to learn to ride a bike without training wheels so you can see that the goals are very specific and they need to be realistic as well. And then shifting flexibly. So for a student in school, for a young student, for example, uh, an ex it would be the sound that O-U-G-H makes, like in a word like tough and a word like dough. So you have to be able to shift and get your head around the fact that the same spelling could have different sounds. And then for an older student or when you're studying math, the ability to solve math problems in a variety of ways, that there is not always one absolute correct approach. The, uh, at home, for I'll give an example for a young child, and that would be you're learning to tie your shoes, and when you're young, you learn it using the uh, bunny ears method, and then as you get proficient in that, you learn to do the, lap, the loop and wrap method. Accessing working memory. So a simple example in school would be solving mental math problems and uh, in unit tests, being able to access that working memory. And in home example of accessing working memory might be steps to using the washing machine. If there's no checklist in front of the washing machine, you have to remember that. And then simple directions for walking back and forth to school might be an example of accessing working memory. And then finally, self checking, self-monitoring. In school, examples could be proofreading your writing assignments, analyzing math errors that you made on a test, making sure you understand directions, and self-monitoring your behaviors like calling out or completing work. And at home, making sure you understand directions for cooking, uh, using social media appropriately, taking turns when playing a game, and a, a simple one, appropriate behavior while waiting for food in a restaurant. So those are just some examples. It's the same skill, the same element, but different applications. Yeah, isn't it interesting how it can look so different from one context to the other? But if we're gonna really support students, exactly, we have to do exactly what Jane said. We have to understand what is the same about those things. And one of the issues that actually does cut through them all is this idea of metacognition, of self-understanding. Because the truth is, especially for young students, we do so much EF support for them. But if they're not aware of it, if they don't understand how to take it on independently and how it relates to who they are as individuals, whether students or family members or just themselves, they aren't going to really carry it forward. And that's a theme that we'll see repeated a lot today. Um, because it's really important to remember that executive function happens in context. Executive function research a lot of times is talking about gray matter, white matter, um, ADHD is a risk factor, or trauma is a risk factor, or developmental progression, but we need to focus on the context. Executive function happens in context, and if we can understand the context where EF is being learned, whether that's home, school, or somewhere else, 
then we're going to see ways to support students' development of executive function. So we're going to take a second and tease out a little bit more um, the differences. How is executive function different at home and at school? Two different settings, what is the same and what is different? So this is going to be our first um, survey, our first activity. So Elizabeth is going to put in the chat a link and that is going to take you to a Google survey. It's going to take you away from the screen you're looking at now and you're going to click that link. So go ahead and open that in your browser and we're going to look and see um, what the answers are. So let me switch my screen over. Um, Check of this is kind of fun. All right. So Elizabeth, you're going to tell me if people can't see what I'm doing. Can everyone see it? Jane? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, awesome. So um, you're going to fill out a question. If you're a parent, I want you to fill out what executive function skills do my kids need to clean out a closet? And then there's a question right underneath that for teachers. So if you're a parent, fill out the parent. If you're a teacher, fill out the teacher. If you're a teacher and a parent, fill out both. And I want to see what's the difference between cleaning out a closet at home and cleaning and organizing your desk at school. So we've got a, a few responses coming in. Let's see here. So we're seeing that a lot of parents are saying, well, you definitely have to create categories and sort materials. Um, and another strong one on stay motivated. And look at the shape of the teacher question. You know, I'm seeing a lot of agreement. In fact, I almost see the exact same shape of that curve. There's a slightly different number, but look at that. It's almost exactly the same. Don't you think that's interesting? Because a bedroom is a bedroom and a closet is a closet. And that should be different. But what we're seeing is that the expectations and the processes you need are the same. So that's excellent. Um, thank you guys for doing that. I'm going to go back to the slide. So this one was also a test. Can we actually make it from the Google activity back to the, the PowerPoint slides? So now everyone click on the Zoom and that will take you back to the slide. Everyone should be looking at the PowerPoint. Elizabeth, you got a tip for that? I do. Um, yes. If you're having trouble getting the link from the chat, you might just have to copy and paste it into your browser because um, there's a few people who have been having trouble getting the link to go all the way through. We're going to try to make sure that doesn't happen, but in a pinch. And if you're too worried about it, you, you could just stay on the PowerPoint and just keep watching that. Um, and you don't, you, know, you don't have to do the surveys, although I think they're kind of fun and I appreciate that. But let's just make that point really clear what we just learned. So whether we're asking kids to clean their room or to organize their desk or even to like make a poster. Remember when you have to make those posters for science fair and things like that or um, get your bag ready for a soccer tournament or something like that. The executive function foundation is the same. Okay, and this is why it's so important that we talk about what's happening at home, what's happening at school, what's happening in the other areas of my students life, because executive function is happening in all those places. Okay. Um, and what we don't want is this clogged funnel. So if you watched our first webinar, you're definitely familiar with this. This idea of a clogged funnel, this is when executive function challenge is at its peak, right? We know the student could do it, but nothing's coming out. They are, they are, you know, they have the skills, they have the brain power, they can't perform. So we have to watch out for these clogged funnels. We need to understand where is it that that clogged funnel is coming, whether it's an exploding backpack or no homework getting done or homework getting done and not turned in, right? We need to understand how can we unclog those funnels. So we like to use this idea of the zone of proximal development as a way to understand where these clogged funnels are coming from. And you can look at the zone of proximal development, whether that's at home or at school. Um, Jane, is this one of your slides or is it coming up? Uh, I think it's, it, well, there the, you have the zone of, which, whenever you want me to do it, because uh, you have three slides for the zone of proximal development, so. All right, well, you know what? Let's take a look at this next one, and why don't you kind of uh, share some of your thoughts on that guy. Okay, so um, the zone of proximal development is kind of interesting when you're thinking about it in terms of school, because it's what students can't do yet, can't do with support, and what they can do independently. And sometimes you see a difference between what teachers and parents think is expected of kids to do independently 
uh, or can't do yet. And I think we have to make sure that we have the right expectations. So for example, um, you might be the parent of a child who is advanced in math. So you think that your fifth grader is ready for algebra that would be that of a, a ninth grader, but they really aren't. And so the teacher has to be able to help you manage those expectations. Uh, the, I talked about riding a bike without training wheels. If you think about the zone of proximal development, uh, the first, number one, can't do yet, would be the, the child who's using training wheels because they're not ready to ride the two-wheeler without those training wheels. And then the second stage can do with support. That could be a parent who's running alongside, as many of us did with our kids, to help them steer and balance. And then the third would be doing it independently. But we wouldn't expect a three-year-old to be able to get to the independent level. Um, so we have to be able to manage those expectations. And uh, we often think of it, I've, I've looked online, and one of the things that I found that I really liked was they called it the um, Goldilocks syndrome. So if you think of the zone of proximal development, the uh, can do independently is like a comfort zone. Kids are very independent. Can't do yet if you are expecting a student to do something or your child to do something that they're really not ready for, that becomes the panic zone. And that's where you get the anxiety. And the middle one, can do with support, is the Goldilocks. It's like it's just right. They can do it with support. It's, they, it's challenging enough. It's not too challenging or too easy. So I hope that explains it a little bit. Yeah, I think that's perfect, actually. This, I love that Goldilocks. Um, also, Jane shared a great video on ZPD, and we'll make that link available later. It's got a great resource. Um, so I want to take a second. I want you to try to answer that question. So we're going to put in two more surveys. Remember, you're going to cut and paste these from the chat box. One is for a teacher, and one is for a parent. So I want you to cut and paste the link that's from a, um, for either the teacher or parent, whichever one you wanna be. And I want you to try to answer some of those questions, okay? So let's take a look. And these are based on um, age, by the way. So let me navigate to that. So go ahead and cut and paste the right um, question for yourself. Here I am looking at the teacher question and I can see there's a question for five-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 13-year-olds, or 17-year-olds. And same thing with the parents five-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 17-year-olds. So I want you to think about how do your expectations change as the kid gets older? And once again, we're focusing on organizing stuff, even though you could ask this about anything, riding your bike, taking notes, you know, understanding what you read, et cetera. So go ahead. All right, we're seeing some responses come in for um, teacher. So we're asking how well should a uh, five-year-old be able to organize, and we see mostly can't do yet. And then look at that, at nine years old, all of a sudden we're saying, yeah, they can do it with support. So just in those couple of years, we're saying, yeah, they can do it. Now, as we get older, the expectations that they can do it independently start to grow, right? And then at 17, we say, yep, they can do it independently, okay? Now let's see how the parents, then that's what you'd expect as a kid gets older, you say, yeah, I can't expect a three or four year old to organize their desk, but now a nine year old with support, a 13 year old, they can um, with support, but a little more independence and a 17 year old, yeah, they should be able to do that independently. Um, now let's see how the parents feel about that. So parents, a little more of them are saying, yeah, my five year old could do it. And nine year, uh, nine -year old, very similar in terms of with support. Um, at 13 year olds, I'm, still pretty similar, but a much bigger chunk of parents are saying, my kids can't do that yet, 5%. And same thing with 17 year old, a slightly smaller chunk of parents are saying, my kids um, can't quite do that independently. So I think there's some really interesting things going on there. Part of it, look at this five-year-old for the parents. Part of it might be that a five-year-old um, is more used to their room. They understand their toy box. They understand, you know, the materials they own. Whereas a five-year-old at school, everything is very new. 
So it could be those pieces. Also, look at the parents. The parents are saying, my 13-year-old cannot do that yet. And the teachers aren't saying that. And that might also be that the parents uh, might be seeing things very differently than the teachers. So let's go back to our slide. Um, so thank you for your answers. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Someone asked how I'm doing these subtitles, by the way. This is built into PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint and Google Slides now do closed captioning automatically. Super, super cool. So think about how those differences in expectations and strategies might create some of those executive function challenges. Um, this is just, this is a version of ZPD that I turned into a, a graph instead of a circle. And this is exactly what Jane said. In the independent area, the student has the strategies and the ability to do what's being asked of them on their own. The challenge, their abilities are here and the challenge is down here. In the zone of support, those things are dead equal. They're taking on things that are hard for them, but we're providing strategies and support that can help them achieve it. And under the can't do yet, the challenge is beyond what they can do, okay? And part of it is expectations and part of it is strategies and support. Those things need to go hand in hand. And those things can evolve as a kid gets older, right? Even more so, think about this. There is a different set of supports at home and at school, a different set of expectations at home and at school. And um, I love it. So Jane, if you wanna interrupt me, feel free. But Jane talked pretty clearly when we were planning this, she had some really interesting things to say about what happens when the parents' expectations and the school's expectations are different. Sometimes kids are sent to a school where the expectations are way up here and the kid is not used to that and that can present big problems. Or sometimes, um, it can go the other way. So Jane, I see you unmuted yourself. Do you want to take away? Because I'm not yeah. doing a good job of saying what you were saying. So go so for it. I, I'm just going to do it anecdotally. I think it might be an example might be easier. Many, many years ago, I was an administrator in a school district. Jane, where... can, you, can you show your video, please? Sure. Thanks. Can you see me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I, I can't see me because I put it off to the side. So that's good. Um, when I was an administrator, it was a very high powered school district and the parents had very, very high expectations. And the teachers, as a result, in, in an average class, it wasn't a gifted class, you had kids who were performing way above grade level. So what was normal, what would be within the normal range was difficult for the teachers, for example, to assess because here they had these kids who were I'll give an example, like in first grade, they're all reading at the beginning of the year. And so if they had a student who was not at that level, the teachers were thinking, well, this kid must have a learning disability. So they referred him, the student to me. I was the director of special ed. And the student didn't, didn't have a learning disability. The expectation that the teacher had was not realistic. So it got to the point where I asked all the teachers one year during the summer, we read the book. Um, yardsticks by Chip Wood, because that gave examples of what you should expect from a five-year-old, a six-year-old, et cetera. So that's one example where the expectations and reality may not be matched. Excellent. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I, I love the way you say that. Um, so expectations and supports, that's what we're going to keep in mind as we move forward. So we're gonna take what we've learned and we're gonna head into um, our hands-on uh, portion. We're gonna talk about organizing materials. I love talking about organizing materials when it comes to executive function. I think it's a very common thing that brings a lot of people to executive function because it is so uh, concrete, you can see it, right? We've all seen those exploding backpacks. We've all seen those uh, exploding purses or, you know, desktops with like a million icons on them or email inboxes with 9,000 unread emails. Um, so that's part of it. But another part of it is that organization has this reputation of, oh, kids hate to organize. Kids hate it and they're so bad at it. So I want to unplug that. I want to unpack that for a second. Why? I mean, everyone knows that kids, and I want to say most kids, um, don't like to organize. Um, but why is that, right? Why is that? And I hate to say it, but I feel like part of it 
is our fault. I think we've sent some messages about organization that make it a little bit hard. So let's take it. Um, so in SMARTS, we do this activity where we teach kids what EF is and we ask them to rate their favorite EF areas. So here's, um, look at this work from, this is a nine-year-old girl. So what is your favorite area of executive function? I love self-checking. Don't you want a nine-year-old to say that? I just, I love it. Um, draw a picture of what executive function looks like to you. So here are her three drawings. The drawing in the middle is self-checking. Do I have everything? So she told me that her parents are divorced and she goes from one house to the other and she never forgets anything, but her sister always does. And she never forgets anything because she always checks her bag before she leaves the house. So she has a strategy to meet the expectation. It works for her and she's proud of it. Um, on the left side is remembering. Let me think about that. And on the right side is organization. No, uh, go clean up, go clean up, ugh. So what does she think organization is? When adults are nagging you. The only time she's heard the word organization is when someone says, you are so messy, you are so disorganized. Why can't you keep clean? And we are all probably guilty of that, right? Um, but that's not, the point of organization is not to make adults happy. Organization is actually an adult secret weapon. It's the only way to get through the day sometimes. So um, in my work with students, I try to help them understand how important organization is. And as part of that, I like to ask them a question. So I'll say, how much time, so here, here are my students. My students are mostly you know, middle school, high school, sometimes college kids. And I'll ask them, how much time do you think your teacher has to spend organizing every week? So someone, you know, type into the chat, how much time do you think a student thinks a teacher actually spends organizing every week? So go ahead, type, if, let me see a few guesses in there. One hour, 10 minutes, four, five hours, one hour, two hours, 15 minutes, 15, so two hours, 20 minutes. Nice, good, oh, four hours, good. Um, so I'll tell you, the, what I'm used to hearing, 30 minutes. 30 minutes a week is all the teacher needs to spend organizing. How close is that? I mean, it's light years apart. But the reason is they never see teachers doing any organizing. A student thinks that they do their homework and they turn it in and it goes into a magical box where it comes out graded, right? They're like, where's my paper, right? They have no idea that you have to take the paper put it in a certain folder, put out a certain folder, do the thing, put it in the grade book, give it back, and you're juggling five different classes and you've got your own life and this and that and the other, but they don't see any of it. Now, same thing, but for parents. And I also, I ask my kids, and this is one kid in specific whose answer I'll give you. I ask them, how much time does your mom spend organizing every week? So if any other guesses, put a few guesses in the chat. How much time um, would, this is a middle school boy, how much time does your mom have to spend organizing every week? Uh, 30 hours all the time, 10 hours, 0, 10, 4, 3, 10 hours all day, 8. Here's what he said, 0. 0 minutes. And I was like, what? 0 minutes? I mean, doesn't she have to put away groceries? And he said, the kitchen came that way. Okay. So once again, we are not doing a good job of showing kids why organization is so important. Yeah, she's magic, exactly. Jason says she's magic. They think that organization is supposed to happen magic. In fact, a lot of kids kind of think that good learning is magic. I don't need to study for a test. I don't need to organize things. I can just do it, right? We need to unpack that. We need to make organization visible so that kids see that organization is actually the secret to being successful as a student or a kid or an adult or whatever it is, okay? We have to help students understand um, realistic expectations for organization. Organization has nothing to do with, oh, my mom will be nice to me if I clean my room. It's about something bigger than that. We also need to help them be more involved in creating their own organization systems and reflecting on what works for them. So um, we're gonna get into our strategy for this. We're gonna do a smart strategy together that you can use to kind of build that organizational know-how in students, whether at school or at home. Uh, okay. So we're going to talk about the four C's strategies, which is one of our absolute favorites, and it's a strategy for organization. And the four C's, in the, as you can see, are clean, customize, categorize, and continue. And of course, you often start with clean, but on, as you see, it's a cycle. You have to be going back to these at all times. But 
Before we get into like the real sort of meat of the strategy, let's talk specifically about categorizing because that's a part that really trips up kids. And that's actually, I think, where you get a lot of pushback because it's kind of anxiety provoking to have to sort of be like, wait, does this go, does the, do these sports shoes go in, you know, sports equipment or do they go in shoes? What do I do with them? So if we try to break down how we talk about category, categories, because that's something that adults kind of naturally do, it can be really, really helpful. So let's get to it. Okay, so what's a category? Category is a group of items that have something in common. As you can see here from our very sophisticated example, uh, we have animals on one side and we have footwear on the other side. So simple enough. And this is, a, this is also, I mean, obviously we're going over this, but this is actually how we would do it in a classroom. We would post something pretty simple and then um, on the next slide, we'll take it to uh, something a little bit more complicated. So here we are. Um, what categories do you see in the fridge? So this is something we'd ask students, but let us know in the chat. What kind of categories of food do you see in the fridge? If you can, if you can see that photo there. Condiments, dairy, sure, fruit, bottles, exactly. Um, and so we like to use this as an example because it's something that all kids, all kids know what the inside of uh, their personal fridge is like and how it's sort of organized. It's, <laughs> somebody just said there are things sold out at the store right now. Very true. <laughs> So that's another good way that we can sort of categorize things. But kids don't do a lot of food organization, so then we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, uh, what categories of thing do we see in this extremely organized closet? So if you'd like to tell us in the chat, that would be great. Dresses, shirts, exactly. Um, bags, footwear, shoes, boots, exactly. So um, we really like to drill down and make this super specific for kids because it's all well and good to say what's a category. And I mean, a lot of them could actually give you uh, a good definition for that, but what does it look like in practice? How do we get to those little sort of nitty gritty things? <laughs> so it says that's designed by the container store and yeah, it is. It is really, really, really nice. Oh, somebody says organizing by color. That is a great little wrinkle because the thing is, is that this sort of overlaps with the customization portion of the four C's is that um, when you're categorizing, things are, categories are not the same for everybody. For some kids, they're gonna wanna organize by color. Some are gonna wanna organize by use. And we need to sort of like give those examples out so that we're not trying to make it uh, one size fits all. Oh, somebody says seasons, items. Those are all great. And now we come to uh, what I think is perhaps the hardest category is the junk drawer. So uh, out of these things, we all have a very unorganized junk drawer in our house. Um, how would you organize the things that we see here? And uh, <laughs> toys, utilities, things found in the home, essentials, sure. Um, but uh, that can be something that's really, really hard where you're saying something where it's pretty arbitrary about what category something's in. So that's something we can also stress is that it's more important that we make up categories, not that the categories be universally true for absolutely everyone. Oh, I like self-care, order of use, yeah, miscellaneous junk, but oftentimes you do actually, you know, have to organize those sorts of things. And of course, then you can also use this to basically say, hey, which of these things are not in a drunk drawer? For, uh, for students. So that there's something where it's like exactly what's in a junk drawer is kind of hard to see, but they can actually be like, oh, probably the newspaper isn't, or probably the brush isn't, but maybe some of those other things are. Did I miss anything there, Michael? Um, no, I think you got it. And I love, um, so you probably can see that this, you see on top, this is from our Smarts Elementary uh, curriculum, and this is an activity we actually do with kids. Give them a bag of junk and let them see what categories they come up with. And what I love to do is they make their categories and I'm like, okay, mix it up, new categories, right? Because they might do it by color, now do it again. How about by what it's made out of? How about by how big it is or how heavy or how pointy? And that gets them, you know, why, don't start off with their messy room. Don't start off with something that you've thought about. Start off with something that is fun and interesting. Organization, you know, you can organize the whole world. Um, and actually, we are going to use that knowledge. So you're going to take what you taught them about organization, and you're going to take that idea of categories, and you're going to build 
organization systems, and it could be the kitchen, it could be the bedroom, everywhere they go, they can start to use categories to understand how the systems are built, right? Um, so now we're gonna get into the 4C strategy. And this is a strategy that I, uh, the film said you wouldn't do that with high schoolers. And you know, I guess it depends on the class. You may not wanna do the junk drawer with high schoolers. But this 4C I actually have done, I've done it with college students, I've done it with adults, and I've done it with really young kids. So let's take a look at the 4Cs and go through each step a little more um, uh, detailed. So the first one we're gonna start with, but Elizabeth did point out, you could start this anywhere you want, but I'm kind of assuming that I'm starting and things are a little messy. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna dump out that backpack. We're gonna you know, dump out that desk. We're gonna go through and we're gonna to start to clean. We're gonna purge it a little bit and get rid of the things we don't need. Because some students are actually very anxious about this. I got kids who do it and they're like, I don't know, what if I need this? So they might need some help um, to make that determination, right? So what should we keep and what should we throw away? So here we've got some science notes with a diagram that's pretty labeled. So personally, I'm gonna keep that because I might need it later for a test. Here I've got a homework with a few vocab words on it. And you know, I don't think I'm gonna need, oh, I will need that because it might be on the test also, sorry. Um, here we go, here's like a do now or an activator or an exit ticket, no name, no title, nothing don't need that anymore. Um, here I've got some notes, and then I'm like writing my friend, hey, what's up, not much, nothing, LOL. Um, ugh, I don't need that, doesn't have a name on it, not graded. Um, here's one, how about my lunchbox? Oh, should I keep that or throw it away? Yes, bring that home, please. How about this banana peel? Uh, maybe we should throw that away and get that out of there. So just that activity can give kids a start. Um, then we're gonna customize it. Elizabeth mentioned this, but um, this is one place where I think we lose kids a lot. Um, you know, I respect that schools sometimes say you have to buy this sort of binder and these sorts of folders. There's a reason for that. But if we don't give kids a way to make it their own, they aren't going to feel like they own their organizational system. We have to break away from this idea of organization means adults yelling at me, and this is a way to do it. How can we customize? So one way that I do it in my office is I have a lot of different models of other ways that kids have organized things. I've got binders, individual folders, multi-subject notebooks, multi-folder pockets, accordion folders. So by providing some modeling, I can still make sure that kids see what successful organization looks like, but they can see some different ways of doing it. But it might even just be enough to give them a chance to draw their name on it or color it in or put some stickers on it. But make sure that kids can make the organization system their own. Um, categories, we went over this one very, very well. Just make sure that you think deeply about categories. It's not just different subjects. It's not just different um, you know, days of the, or when it's assigned. It could be notes versus homework, tests versus whatever. Um, think about the different categories of the thing you're going to be using. And you know, you'll notice that these examples are very school-based, but you can certainly think of categories for your toys, categories for your clothes, categories for your electronics, whatever it is that needs to be organized. Categories for your email. I see there's an interesting uh, conversation going in the chat about organizing emails. What are the categories of the emails? And then continue. No organization system on earth can maintain itself under its own weight. That's why my desktop looks like you know, a junk drawer sometimes. That's why our planners might get a little cluttered. We have to build in time to declutter, and that's a part of every organization system. I like to encourage students to set a time goal, because they'll always say, well, I'll clean it when it gets dirty, but then it's too late. It's so much easier to clean it out a little bit every week or a little bit every other week than to wait until it's messy. So building some time in can really make a big difference in terms of maintaining your organizational system. Um, and so, so that time to continue is what will save you time, will help you find stuff, and will help you stay on top of your organization, and it gives them that ownership. And so this is, so there's lots of different ways that we can do this, right? This four C's can be applied in so many different things. I've done four C's for backpacks, desks, um, email inboxes, electronic folders. I did four C's for chocolate chip cookie recipes once just to see if it could be done, and it can. So we're gonna do the four C's. Oh, let's do the four C's together. So Elizabeth, can you post um, our last quiz? And that is gonna be the four C's, and then we're gonna see how do people organize 
um, your clothing. So go ahead and open up the uh, link in the chat and let me just bring you to the form. Um, this is four C's for organizing your clothes. So first I'm gonna ask you, what are the categories that you use when you get through your clothes? Short sleeve, long sleeve, sweaters, pants, shorts, accessories, clean and dirty. How about the not dirty but not totally clean category? It's an important category, especially these days. It's like, I'm not going anywhere. It's not that dirty. Color, fabric type, right? Um, what do you use to organize your stuff? How do you customize it with closets, dressers, that one chair in your room that you pile all that stuff on? Um, how often do you clean it out? Daily, weekly, monthly, right? So go through, fill in those things, and let's see what sort of organizational systems do we have in the Zoom webinar with us right now? All right, I see the responses are pouring in. Let's take a look. See if there's any things. All right, I see uh, short sleeve, long sleeve, very popular, shorts. Um, you know, I'm so excited I can wear shorts at work now. Oh, don't tell, don't tell anyone. It's against the uh, dress code. Um, yeah, all right, we're seeing. Not many people are doing it by fabric type. Only a few people must have worked retail at one time. Color is pretty low, dirty, clean, good, popular. Pants are, pants are pulling ahead, nice. How about how do you customize? A lot of people are using their closet. Nice, some people got those walk-in closets, so jealous. Um, that's a very common one. Dresser is coming in second with laundry hamper coming in a close third. And finally, how, when do you clean things out? Oh my gosh, someone says once a year, not enough. Seasonally, actually seasonally makes sense. Um, and then weekly and daily are kind of uh, close competitors. So you'll see that as adults, we have a lot of different approaches. We've come up with our own customized approach to keeping organized. And that is awesome. But we need to help our students develop that as well, right? So let's come back to that PowerPoint. Thank you guys for sharing your organization approaches. Um, Can I just say one thing, Michael, do you mind? Please do, yeah. yeah. So I, I was thinking, now that we're all home for many weeks and we don't know when we'll be let out, um, this strategy for parents would be, a, it's a great time to have the discussion with your kids, whether you start with the refrigerator or the closet or the drunk, the uh, junk drawer before you get on to their own personal space. You know, give them examples, let them help you organize. And I think for the teachers out there who are doing remote learning, it's also a great time to do this and let kids look around their house and come up with the plans, you know, speak to their parents because we really have the time to do this now. Yep. Absolutely. And I like, so building on what Jane said, so in smarts, you know, we recommend like things like that junk drawer. Don't start with the things that they don't hate the most. Start with things that are interesting and engaging and build from there. Um, our smarts activity has what we call the backpack relay race. We turn organization into a game. Who can find this? Who can find that? How did you find it? Right? Organization should not be about nagging people. It should not be about, oh, is there something moving in your backpack? I'm worried that it's like decomposing. You know, it's about owning those systems. So like Jane said, let's use this time where kids are creating a new space for themselves, a new workspace, a new relationship with how they learn to create their own systems, their own strategies, all right? Um, I love, so I love talking about organizations, so thank you so much. Now we're gonna move into these, you know, these six steps for getting started. How can we build that bridge between home and school to erase those gaps, to erase those dangerous gaps and expectations and supports and support everybody, student, teacher, and parent in this executive function game, okay? Now I wanna make sure, you know, executive function is hard work. You're not necessarily gonna walk out of here and turn a light bulb. We're gonna take it and we're gonna start this conversation. These are six steps for getting started. So the very first step is let's make our expectations clear. You know, teachers, students, and parents, we've got our own executive function strengths and challenges. We've got things that are gonna go well for us and things that are not. What we really should do together is get those expectations clear. If the teacher and parent both know what the organizing, goal setting, shifting, remembering, and self-checking expectations are, if those are spilled out, then um, actually if the teacher, student, and parent all know the expectations, we can all be on the same page. And that's gonna do a lot to build that bridge we've been talking about all day. Next, with those expectations, we can make sure that the strategies are visible and explicit. 
Um, so we talked in our first webinar about IC strategies, um, how to make strategies systematic and explicit. So you can go ahead and watch that if you didn't, but make sure that strategies for things that are challenging are being taught explicitly and make sure students understand the point of a strategy. Now, this last one about modeling is really important. It's especially important for parents because, you know, sometimes parents will say, I can't teach my kids how to organize or manage their time because they want to fight with me and disagree with me. And unfortunately, that's a fact of life for many parents. So what you could do instead is make sure you model the strategies that you use, okay? Um, you can make sure that your calendar is visible. Make sure that the way you organize the kitchen or do the grocery shopping or organize your den or something is very visible, okay? That's gonna be really, really important as a way to making sure that your strategies are visible. So your kids don't say, oh, my mom spends zero minutes a day, all right? Um, and the next one, so Jane, will you take us into this next one? Yep, okay, so um, in order for, kids to be able to be successful when they're learning these strategies and certainly if there are kids who have some impulsivity etc you need to set the environment and some uh, external structures so that they can be successful so uh, it says limited distractions whether the kids are at school or at home and we're way beyond the day where we would say well the student who uh, needs space and ADHD should be in the front of the room so they won't be distracted because the reality is that for some students being in the back of the room where they can get up and move around is really a much better situation for them. And at home, if your child, if you're trying to set up an area, for example, for your child to do their work, it needs to be a place that has minimal distractions. So if, uh, working in the kitchen while you're in the kitchen cooking and they're supposed to be online with their class may not be the best setup. So if you can alter that, that would be great. And then just emphasizing rules to remember. Michael said clear expectations, verbal and visual cues. Kids do very well with visual cues. And again, we all know this, that if uh, kids are impulsive, giving them fidgets or alternative strategies could be very helpful. So you need that base to set up the environment for the kids. Accentuate the positives. So um, make sure you deliver the strategy in a way that acknowledges the strength. So it needs to be realistic. You know, you're not expecting kids to do this the first time around and you are going to use a reward system and an example of a reward system and, and labeled phrase would be, instead of just saying thank you um, for, to the child when they've done something, you could say something like, thank you for getting your backpack organized when I asked you. It's very, very specific. And you're even going to tell them why it mattered. Now we can get out of the house on time tomorrow. So you, kids deserve an explanation. And I think those things would be helpful. Uh, let's see, try out st strategies in other areas. Yeah, so kids are, you know, they understand in sports the reward system, the praise, et cetera, and the directness of it. So I think that if you try, if you use some of those analogies for sports, that would be very good with kids as well. Um, you could have a reward system that gives kids uh, a menu of rewards. So it could be an extra TV show. They, well, not now, I have, have a friend over, but maybe not now. Uh, an extra half hour before bed or playing a certain game. And each of those, I've seen this work where parents set up a reward system and each reward is worth a different number of points. Um, the goal of all of this is to be able to have your child be more independent and you want to be able to pull back on the supervision that you are providing to them. So communicate. Okay, so uh, the bottom line is this can only be done if teachers, parents, and students are communicating and they're all on the same page. So I think uh, the title of this webinar, Bridging Home and School, is perfect because the parents are not working in isolation, teachers can't work in isolation, and if they do, 
the one who's going to suffer is the student because then you have teacher expectations, parent expectations, they may be not the same, strategies may be totally different. I think you get the idea. So that communication between students, teachers, and parents is essential. And parents need to let teachers know when things are not working and teachers need to let parents know the same. And the student should be able to say, you know, mom, in school, I organize my desk this way and this is what really helps me and so the parent could come on board with that so yeah that's perfectly said so i just wanted to flash this up there this is also from the elementary curriculum and we call it a bridge to home letter and this is exactly what jane had just described like having the student explain to the parent the strategies they've been learning that's a very empowering way for the student to own it and then we ask the student to interview their family member about what they're doing so the student will say, here's how I organize my desk now. I draw a picture and I do the different categories. How do you organize things? Or whatever it is, how do you estimate your time? How do you, you know, remember what you need to do? Um, by having that conversation between all of those players that Jane just talked you through, that's how you build that bridge. Because we, I mean, just to say it again, we need expectations and supports to be on the same page as consistently as possible, okay? Um, and this last one is also really important when it comes to EF strategies. We have to make sure to reflect. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I finally talked a kid into trying a planner or a to-do list and they, like, it didn't work. Like, it doesn't have to work immediately the first time. We're going to reflect on it. Well, what part was hard or what part did we forget or when and where? How can we tweak it? Reflection is the essential process of students becoming more independent on it because then they can say, well, this works for me and this doesn't. And that's how you know it's working, by the way. I work with teenagers. That's how you know it's working when they say, I don't like your strategy, here's mine. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> you know, that's great. That's exactly what you want. So we have strategy reflection sheets that we use in SMARTS to ask, well, what did you use? And did you like it and did you not? But honestly, it's just about asking questions that address those three bullets. Um, how does this relate to your strengths and challenges? How can you reflect on your performance? And then what do you wanna do differently uh, next time? So those are those six steps for getting started. I encourage you to take those steps and kind of weave them into your education, um, whether you're a parent or teacher or student. If we follow those, we're going to be working on building that bridge. Um, so we, we only have four more minutes on the official time. I'm willing, we'll probably go like five minutes over to get some uh, questions answered. But before we do that, first, let me just... Um, Elizabeth will put up a link to the evaluation form in a second, and she's got a whole spiel. Um, but I'm going to turn on to this last slide so you can see my email. Um, executive function is the meat of what we do. We love supporting teachers and their families and communities, especially in a time when executive function demands are just over all of our heads. So I encourage you to fill out that evaluation form. You can get more information on SMARTS, on our other trainings and, and offerings. Um, look on the website. We've got some great resources that we've developed for this time um, for parents to use, um, other video resources, time management resources for parents, things for teachers as well. We've got additional webinars, so definitely keep in touch.